Good morning everyone and welcome to Go Ape Coventry. I'm absolutely delighted that we've been invited here today by Bex and Tris Mayhew, the co-founders of Go Ape, uh, to find out about their journey to employee ownership. So Tris, Bex, welcome and thank you for inviting me here today. Thank you for being Great here. Pleasure. I'm absolutely delighted that you are the latest company to become employee owned and our audience, our delegates at the conference this year are going to be enthralled to hear about the story. But can I take you right back to the beginning, first of all, which is your mission to be the greatest adventure company on the planet. Where did that come from? Do you want to answer that one? Um, I can sort of set the scene as to yes, where we were. Yeah. So we were both uh, in London, we had one child already, um, so she was a baby, Phoebe, she was 14 months, um, and we've been thinking about, you know, what, what next? It's sort of the corporate life, juggling, having a child in London, both working in, for corporates. It, it had its time and we learnt a massive amount, but really we wanted to escape that and do something together um, and be able to work together towards something that was really meaningful yeah. and I think a lot of it was also having control of our lives and having control of our destinies and so that was the sort of space that we were at yeah. looking at well what what is it where is it um, so that kind of sets the scene Do you want to carry uh, well, on? I'd been a soldier till I was about 30 and I tried working for other companies for about three years and I just felt really dispirited that the only thing they seemed to be interested in was making a dollar um, and ultimately if they weren't going to make a dollar, they would do whatever it took, you know, divide the problem by the average salary and just cut the legs off, yeah. you know, 400 people in GE's case or whatever. And I just thought there's got to be a better way. And I, when I'd left the army, I'd drawn a picture of what I thought success looked like. And it had teepees and tree houses and windsurfers and bonfires. And I thought, yeah, wouldn't that be brilliant to be able to run something like that? And I thought, but you're never going to be able to make a living out of trees and teepees and tree wow. houses um, so I did the boring thing I joined you know big American companies and um, Beck said you're losing your mojo this isn't for you and I dug out that picture and I thought well okay I'm gonna be a failure but I'm gonna be a happy failure because I'm gonna go and do something in the trees um, but at least I'll be you know around for my kids and um, so we were looking to do something outdoorsy which ticks the box from the sort of army sort of adventure type background and we were on holiday in France, um, driving through the south of France, and we saw a leaflet for something a bit like Go Ape, which sadly isn't in business any longer. But we drove out of our way, went and had a look at what it was, and I think immediately we thought, oh, hang on, this is the thing. We walked into some woods a bit like this, and we just heard laughter. We didn't see anything, we just heard laughter coming towards us. And we walked towards that, and there was a family with some teenagers up in the trees, and of course the teenagers were having a great time, but the parents were the ones that really struck us. And Bex turned to me, she said, look at their eyes. They haven't had this much fun in years. Yeah. And she said, we should be doing that. And I was already planning on how to write my resignation letter and finding out who had built this and could we go and talk to them? Would they come and build for us in the UK? And that's what we did. We went and found the builders up a mountain in, uh, in and We the, literally in the did Alps. drive from there to go straight to the builders spent five hours talking not very good French, kind of English French between the two and just working out, you know, yeah. how And we to don't do know this. what we shook hands on, but that handshake has stood 20 <laughs> yeah. years. We've never had a contract. They work exclusively for us in the UK. At times we've helped them out, at times they've helped us out, but they are great friends and colleagues and, um, and they've been integral to our and they have success. built and they still everything. build all of this although we so have our all own of our 35 team. courses and all of our 16 courses in the us um all built by it's been a great partnership so how long did it take you to go from the visit to france to the first site in thetford august was our holiday uh, i went oh. back in in october and november to talk to them you know because they want to be sure that we were actually serious um, I was at risk of redundancy within GE as they were merging four divisions into one, and um, which was brilliant because eventually that did happen and we had three months of money. Um, and we got planning permission in January and we opened on the 22nd of March 2002, so really quite quickly. But the key thing was getting our insurance. Our insurance was really hard to get because mm. obviously we're 
an unknown thing, never happened in the UK before. Yeah. Finding the right insurer who would, would uh, back us was the, the problematic bit. And um, the rest, you know, is history. So that piece of paper with the, the trees, the teepees, and, and that's somewhere still on your desk, is it at home? It is somewhere <laughs> in some file. But We've got a lot of know, memorabilia. It will yeah. be there. And it was a picture, a very bad picture. But I mean, you know, we've always talked about trying to picture what success looks like. And if you know what that is, you, it's easier to walk towards it. It is. So can we roll forward now to last month? Um, and I know obviously that will have taken a while for you to get to the announcement last month. But can we start by you telling us a little bit about when did you start to think about we need to make a plan? So mm. Bex, when were you starting so, to think? So I think, it, I think it's been something that's been all the way along the journey. You know, we've always thought, what's it going to look like into the future? Yeah. And we've always been very clear. We've got three children, two now at university, which makes me feel really grown up. Um, We've always been clear that they would have their own destiny and their own paths, and they've always thought that as well. You know, they, they're going their own way. So it's always been, well, where, where do we see this going? You know, we've built a business where the culture is very unique um, and the values are something that every single one of our team lives every day. And we want to see that go into the future. And I think we've talked quite a lot along the way about we want to be able to still go to go eight courses and still see what we created, you know, obviously moving on and developing, but very much having the essence that we've instilled in it all the way through into the future. So how do we make that happen? Right. And we did uh, go through a process in 2019. So we did look at, you know, is this the right way to go? Um, a process we look getting at a investors, potential investor yeah, in. So yeah. looking at private equity, looking at trade. Yeah. And, um, in a way, although that was really hard work, it actually really instilled in us, uh, you know, no, we can't see this. We, we want to have some sort of control into the future about what we're going to look like. And we just don't know. And you talk to potential investors and they talk about loving your culture, but actually are their ambitions going to be different? Are they really going to be aligned with us? And so that process was really useful. That was the point of going, no, we just can't see that this is the right route for our business. This is just not where we want to go. Which, which is uh, a very familiar story. Um, mm. I've heard lots of founders talk about starting to explore a trade sale route and realizing it wasn't going to deliver on their ambitions. Mm. So how did you end up then considering employee ownership? Where did that come from? Well, so we didn't know about it as a thing until um, probably two or three years ago. And at the time we thought, well, look, you know, there are four shareholders in Go Ape. Um, Bex and I had the majority share, but it's a family run and owned business. There's my great mate from the army, Will Galbraith, who's been a brilliant operations director all the way through. We basically sort of did a deal after we got it going, six months after we got it going, I said, Will, will you come and run the business for us? And he said, no, you seem to be doing a reasonable job. You know, I'll build them and train them. You know, we both know that actually I will be running the business, but you can have the sort of the title. Actually, he doesn't say that, but I mean, it's been a very tight... That's a Chief Gorilla team. title. Yeah. <laughs> and then a few years later, I got my brother to come and join as well because we wanted some more director muscle and somebody who I could trust and respect. And yeah. if he, I said, come and join. And if you, you know, for the first two years, uh, be trained up doing some business development, but then take over as managing director, which is what happened. Um, but I wasn't sure that they were going to be able to come along with the EOT thing because you probably don't get as much out as if you were to sell because you know, maximizing um, returns to shareholders is something that's more important if you've got a minority investment. Yeah. But actually they've been hugely enthusiastic about this being the right path too because I think by going through the process of looking at an external investor and then pulling out of that a few years ago, um, when we felt that actually they wouldn't be the right custodians for our family of yeah. Go Ape, um, it was confirmed by some of the people when we said, actually, we're, we're pulling out, we don't want to go through this. They then said, well, actually, we didn't want to have the whole business anyway. We just want six of your best courses and we're going to develop those. And presumably they would have just sold the others off or yeah. not kept, you know, and you think, well, there you go. You know, yeah. they'd all said, oh, no, we love your business, love the values, love everything. And actually, you've admitted to us straight away that you would have just chopped and sold yeah. it on. So did you, so having looked at the employee ownership route and finding the employee ownership trust, the EOT that you've described, 
then what did you do after that? Did you go so, and look at it elsewhere? So actually when, so we looked at um, and put in an EMI scheme and so we met up with, it was one of those recommendations of who we should speak to. We eventually got to Pet Franklin, mm -hmm. who had been amazing, and William Franklin of Pet Franklin. We went off to see him, so we always like to meet people and spent hours talking about how to do this scheme. And as a part of that, he talked about EOT. So I think it was the seeds of, well, he suggested wow, this it. sounds, yeah, yeah. No, he, he suggested it came up with it. Cool. And we thought, well, this sounds really, really interesting. So it started bubbling away then, which was three or four years ago. Right. And, and you'd seen it in other companies by then, had you? Well, obviously everyone had heard of John Lewis and always sort of, you know, as consumers, um, you know, you, you know, you feel the difference when you mm. go to Waitrose mm. or, or John Lewis because they care more. Um, mm. And I think people who work within Go Ape, you know, feel quite vocational about what we do. Lots of people feel it's the first job where they actually feel they really belong. Yeah. Um, and that's something that's very special to us. It does feel like it's family. We wanted to make sure that that carries on. Um, and when we realised that it was a real thing and we'd realised that we didn't want to go down a more conventional route, uh, we went back to Pet Franklin and said, look, can we talk seriously about how we would do this? Right. And then they helped you decide how to structure that and you've sold 90% of the business? So 90%, yeah. So well, we had a, keep... yeah. We had an internal conversation about what would be the right way to go and the management team ongoing said we would like you to not exit entirely we want to have your experience there yeah. you know like grandparents bex hates the idea it makes it sound really so old can we just cut the grandparents <laughs> too thing. young for grandparents <laughs> yeah. but you know so we've got you you know able to still be involved um but that we don't want you to be you know we decided to keep on 10 percent because they said we'd like you to keep you know 10 percent. so it's not no one thinks you've got control of the business still, mm. but it shows you're still interested yeah. for the long term. Yeah, yeah. And I, so, yeah, I think part of, you know, if you do sell, I think what you hear is that sometimes things do start to falter because you completely cut those ties. Mm. Whereas, you know, we are not going to be in the in the day to day, but there's still the ability for us as trustees, yeah. you know, to be there to discuss things, to have an ongoing legacy with Go Ape. And that yeah. for us it is, I mean we've talked about it, but it is like a family to us. So we work with uh, a lot of people who have been with our site managers for 14, 16, 18 years. Um, and so that was so important into the future. And for us too, you know, so Go Ape was about creating adventures and encouraging everyone to live life more adventurously. That is our raison d'etre, that is our core of what we do. And we're in our, I'm in my early 50s, <laughs> And um, we've got, I don't know how long of hips and knees left. You know, we want to be able to go and live life more adventurously. You know, 18 years is a long time. Although we're still really passionate about going, you know, it's time. The, the, the team has been through two MBAs in the last two years by getting through COVID. They're ready to take it on. Yeah. You know, they're like, um, you know, the analogy, I suppose, of, uh, you know, kids who've left university and they don't need their parents around telling them what to do or you know, controlling the details of their lives. They're ready to go. Yeah. And so we don't, we don't want to hold them back. And we want to be able to go and do other things while still staying interested. So we're going to go and visit other sites, you know, show that we're interested. I trained as an instructor again last year. I did shifts in the forest just as an instructor. I'd like, I really love doing that. I'm hoping to be able to do that again ongoing when teams are short and they, you know, they, they, they haven't got enough staff for the day or whatever, I'll go and help. <coughs> but I don't want to be in control or putting the levers. I just want to be doing, it, you know, showing that I'm still interested. Yeah. Um, and there's no more important job than being an instructor looking after our customers. So when you go back to the rationale and the reasons for why you did this, obviously mm. securing that legacy, making sure that your values still held true. Are there other benefits that you're hoping that the business is going to experience from this move? I think definitely. I mean, we've talked about um, already the employee council, we're already putting together how that's going to work. Yeah. And we're going to go into the election, I think, later on this month. Um, but, you know, we've always <coughs> we've got 35 different locations. We're based all around the UK. Yeah. Um, and what I think will be fantastic is a much easier way to channel all those ideas, all that innovation 
all that real passion for the business from all of those different sites yeah. um, and having them coming on to an employee council. There's so much at the moment, we're actually um, putting our application to become a B Corps, which I think is, you know, really sits well with being an EOT. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that is in, but there's so much to do around that. And we fit really well in being a B Corps. We're a naturally powered business. Yeah. Um, but the whole environmental side, there is more we can be doing, but that has to come from the root and branch of all the sites, from yeah, all the people who really care. Yeah. So I think that, uh, will be fantastic and that we will just get just a lot more engagement, I yeah. hope. Yeah. And I judging also, by people's response, I think, you know, they are very well, much I wanted to ask that. you about people's response, which was my next question. So you've obviously got your tribe. Mm. So what was their response? But also what has been the response outside of the business from mm. your collaborators, your landowners, the people, you know, the, the partners that you work with? So Tris, can you tell well, me? Well, I mean, it's... There's a thousand people in Go Ape, and we've been, you know, we've been really, really busy this year. We've had one and a half million customers through 35 sites. So, you know, the teams at site have been working seven days a week, long, long hours, long days. So it's quite a challenge to try. You can't get everybody in one room and brief every week. So we put on a bunch of conference calls, um, but we probably only probably reached about a fifth of our of our um, 1,000 people who've actually been on those calls. So it is about disseminating through the sites and site managers. So we've still got a way to go on making sure that everyone really feels the difference. Yeah. Um, and it's only been 10 days since we've actually done it. And you can't announce it until quite late, although we've been doing conference calls for um, six weeks or so. So um, as to par partners, um, most, well, I think they're all wholly um, really supportive. Um, mm. Our largest uh, partner for, for um, locations is the Forestry Commission. And the government put in the EOT scheme because they want to encourage more employee ownership and they think it's a great thing. I'm hoping it will give us an edge in terms of when we renew leases and, and, and others they, and, and things like that. They will say, well, look, this is a really good thing which is in line with government objectives and I'm, I'm hoping that will give us a, you know, a favourable consideration. But I think also importantly, um, I think our customers, if as they get greater awareness, will think, well, this is a really good thing. I've always liked Go8. The people are really good, but it's not surprising they're employee owned. Yeah. You know, they, and fits with one of your values, which is doing the right thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 And yeah. they are, you know, everybody buys into that. On every job description, it says, you know, we want to be socially, environmentally responsible, but not preachy. We're about encouraging, you know encouraging people moving from I can't to I can, all those sort of things, people go, look, this is the right job for me. And, and if they don't buy into that sort of stuff, then we encourage them to go and work elsewhere because we say, look, life's too short to be doing something you don't enjoy. Yeah. And I think looking at the press coverage as well, just to add to that, all the comments, um, particularly under the Times one, just quite interesting, people who knew Go8 said, I can see it, it sort of fits. Yeah. You know, I can see that's the right way to go. You know, we've been there. We know what the team are like. They're so engaged. They're so naturally encouraging. They're, you know, they are, yeah, good for them because it's the right thing for yeah. the business. So, but yours is a business that obviously puts health and safety first, obviously, and so you evaluate risks. Mm. So, are there any risks in doing this? Do you think for the business or for you personally? Sure, mm. but I mean, Go It's always been about being adventurous, and it's been about the journey rather than the destination. And if this doesn't work, you know, then as shareholders with a deferred interest, we won't get paid out. But, you know, that seems totally in line with how we've always run the business. We've been about sharing the risk and sharing the rewards. Um, and I think we feel very confident that we trust the business with our team more than anybody else, particularly a bunch of suits. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think the team know that we've put that trust in them. And that, I think, is, is massive because people step up to that. If you put trust in them, if you believe in them, they're going to step up and, and do it. So we feel very confident we've got the right people in place. So yeah. finally, what's the big adventure for you next then? You talked about it's been 18 years here. This has been a great adventure. What's next? Yeah, well, Tris mentioned earlier, but, you know, as we grew up with our kids, we used to put them in a motorhome and travel around all the go ape sites and chat to the customers and be there. And that was fun, stressful, crazy, whatever. Um, but now, just having a bit more time, you know, there are hills to climb, there are bike things to do, 
We can visit the site, which would be great, but we can spend more time, we can have our own adventures. And I think jumping into new things straight away, it's like, well, let's just have some time. You know, there are, it yeah. is the next chapter and is exciting, um, but just not jumping in too quickly to what the next thing is. And if Tris gets his pencil out and starts drawing another diagram, <laughs> I guess you might take that off him quite quickly. Well, funny enough, I think we've both been driven by dreams in our lives. We had a you know, picture of what great looked like, and I find myself slightly dreamless for the first time in my life. And I don't know whether that means I've just sort of, you know, it's a problem, or perhaps I'm actually happy. I'm not quite sure. Well, I'll try and work it Maybe out. you've reached that reached stage of contentment. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for talking to me this morning. Thanks for inviting me here today. I know we're going to do a bit more filming now. Um, and I look forward to having the conversation with you on the day at the conference when I think you're going to answer some questions live for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>
And in a way, Tris and Bex and Go Ape saved me. <laughs> they brought me into their family and that's what it is. It is a family. It's not, uh, they're not, you know, workers, co-workers, they are a family. And to be part of a business that was growing, challenging itself, taking commercial risks, uh, having real fun in what they do, but also really a true respect for each other from, you know, in, for the fellow employees and for the people within the business. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very, very proud to have been part of that journey so far and to continue to be part of the team uh, working together for Go Ape. So um, you know, that's a bit about my background. Brilliant. OK, well, look, I'm going to come back to you in a, a few minutes. I'm just going to kick off with some of our questions. This is a really important opportunity for our delegates now in the next 20 minutes to ask questions. So um, you've been voting for your questions uh, and keep do asking them. I'm going to ask the first question, which has been the most popular one, I think, which has been uh, Tris Bex and, and maybe Nick as well. What has been the biggest challenge so far during the process? So can I can I go to you first, Tris? your thoughts on that well i think nick's got a good answer to this but i sort of struggle to really think of anything that was a, a really big challenge i mean it's been a long process we were working hard at it for about 10 months in terms of the legals and the documentation and and getting it right um and but i don't think that was a challenge that was just sort of you know stuff we had to get done but nick you were saying something earlier so can i hand over to you yeah so i think the biggest challenge you know and this will be ongoing is that you know we have up to a thousand employees at the peak of our season this that we have a lot of seasonal uh, employees so i think really really getting employee ownership embedded throughout the organization is going to be a big challenge for us uh, and obviously with covid less opportunity that we've had in terms of traveling around our sites uh, to get the message out you know that makes it more challenging um but i think we're getting there we, we we've got we've got a big uh, get together an actual get together in the new year so we'll be meeting our site managers our deputy managers and uh, all the sort of senior people at our sites and i think that'll really help get the message out um and maybe we've been a bit at Go8, we, we always like to be as transparent as possible. So we've given out loads of information and I think possibly it's a bit of information overload and we need to be a little bit more clearer and simpler in the message. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to another question now. Bex, can I go to you? Um, one of the questions has been about how are you feeling about stepping back and allowing the, the new management team, Nick and the rest of the team to step up to the new role. How are you feeling about this? Well, it's interesting. Um, I think one of the things is that it feels entirely the right time, which might strike people as odd with something that's fully consumed our lives the last, it'll be 20 years in March. Um, so it will leave a gap, but I absolutely feel like it is the right time. The team are in the right place. Um, the business is really thriving. And I'm not going to name our ages, but we're ready to have more time to do other things. Um, we'll still visit Go Ape sites, but I think when we're there, it'd be fantastic to be able to walk in the lakes, not just visit Winlatter, Grisdale, and be racing off to Delamere. So it gives us opportunities at this stage um, to see our kids, tour at uni, but really to do some of the challenges that I've started to shove up on the fridge that I want to do over the next year or two while still remaining, you know, the founders who are now trustees of Go Ape. We're not disappearing off to another planet. Um, and but and that, is it, are, are, you, are you confident, yeah. sorry to interrupt, are you confident in the team's ability to step up because of what Nick has just said, which is Go Ape is a family and always has felt like a family? Because that, there'll be people in the audience now who are thinking about doing what you guys have just done and maybe worried about, you know, how will the team cope? But it sounds like you're confident because you've built that culture already. Yes, and also um, the reaction from people around the business is that they've got confidence in Nick and the senior team, I feel. Uh, they don't see us disappearing off the planet, but they believe and they've been working uh, for Nick. And, you know, I think part of 
we've all been through COVID and that's been incredibly challenging. But actually, in a way, that might have given them even more confidence that the team can get through anything. Uh, we've okay. proved it over the last couple of years. So I think, you know, that, that's been huge. Uh, Nick's got the team support. And yes, I feel really confident. Okay. Nick, can I go to you? Um, we've heard from Bex, and I'm sure if Tris had any alternative views, he would have dived in. Um, how are you feeling about life after Tris and Bex? Well, I think, I think it's not. And I think that's the reality is that I think one of the, the really, really big benefits of employee ownership is that, um, you know, the founder shareholders, you know, are, are remaining as trustees for, you know, for a period of time, which enables there to be a really, really good transition in terms of and succession from founder owners to the employee owned business. So I think it's not goodbye. It's a different role. It's a different relationship. But we still have access to Trispex, Will's huge amounts of experience uh, and knowledge of the business. So I think that's a really important part of employee ownership, that structure, which doesn't happen um, all the time with private equity or a trade sale. You know, you, you often lose that experience overnight. And I think this enables that experience to still be there to support, to challenge as well. Um, but I think uh, I'm, I'm really confident we've got a fantastic team. You know, we really have, and that's, you know, it's a credit to Trispex and Will that they've built that over the time, but, um, you know, the knowledge, the experience, the appetite is there to grow the business from the employees. And okay. they are think, truly excited about the future. Okay, I've got a couple of quick fire questions. There's a, there's a, there's a theme emerging in the questions. Well, there's a couple of themes. Uh, one of them is around, when did you tell the employees and have you got any tips on engaging the team in what you've told them? So, Tris, when did you first start talking to the employees? Can we keep that quite short? Because I want to move on to some other questions as well. Yeah, well, officially, obviously, it was probably only within the last two months. But Nick's laughing because there are a couple of people that I was just having chats with saying, sounding the ground, what do you think about? And then maybe he got a call saying, What's Tris talking about? <laughs> so probably <laughs> later than we would have liked, but we had to make sure that we could get HMRC clearance and all the other things. And we didn't want to, you know, we didn't want to, to say we we're going to do something and then find out that for whatever reason, we weren't able to get it across the line. So probably in the last two months, but I think the senior team obviously first and then cascaded down and then everybody in the company had two or three uh, chances to join conference calls and with big Q&A sessions for in the last month. Okay, I think you've picked up two answers there. So thanks for that. Um, so uh, say what you're going to do, but be confident you can do it and cascade and share the information as widely as you can, I think. And also from what you said earlier, Nick, um, uh, don't do information overload, but keep it simple and, and straightforward. Um, I think there's a set of there's Sorry. There's one really powerful thing which I've got to say, and it's a big thank you as well. I think there was we were, we were truly inspired, and so was was all the people, you know, all the employees in the business who listened to the stories from Richard Sounds, from Alpha Leisureplex, um, and from Riverford. I mean, they they've been fantastic, and they've really helped us in our journey to become an employee-owned business. Yeah, and that is definitely one of the benefits of being part of a community like the EOA, where we can make those introductions for you. Um, so thank you for that. Um, can we go back now to some of the technical details of what you did? Um, there's a few questions about the exiting directors and incentivizing management and how do you keep people like Nick and others engaged at a time when you were going through this process. So this is definitely a question, Tristan and uh, Bex, for you. Um, there's some questions here about, you know, what did you think about? Because the, there isn't just the two of you, there are other directors involved. You had Nick that you wanted to make sure stayed on board. So can you talk us a little bit about your thinking behind how you achieved this? And did you, did you, and you mentioned on the video about starting early doors a couple of years before this, looking at some share plans. So can we, can you take us back to some of the decisions you took along the way? Do you want to go, Vex? 
Uh, I'll start off with uh, three years ago, we met with Pep Franklin, William Franklin of Pep Franklin, uh, to talk about putting in an EMI scheme. So we had that in place, but at that point we hadn't decided what the exit was, and that was in order to make sure that if we sold, that we could in a tax efficient way, thank all of our employees. So we put that in place, we got the relationship with William Franklin, um, Jess, if you want to talk about the William Franklin and then the moving forward from there, I'll hand over to you. Well, there are four shareholders, so we're independent. So there's me, as you heard in that clip, if you were listening, it was uh, Bax and I and we're the majority shareholders. But then there was my great mate from the army, uh, Will Galbraith, who is the ops director from the, after the first six months onwards. And then my brother, Jerome who I recruited from being a barrister uh, and two years later became the managing director. Um, and I just was concerned that they were not able to um, basically get the returns on their time and investment and risk if we went down the EOT when I first route, when I first heard about it. Um, but because we looked at, we sort of flirted with um, getting an outside investor. Um, that we pulled out of that we never got comfortable with it um and basically the business wasn't looking as strong then as it is now and the returns really weren't going to be enough for the minority shareholders so i didn't feel i could ask them to go down this route thankfully um it looked pretty clear from the beginning of this year that we were going to be able to look after everybody um while still going in terms of shareholders while still going down the eot route um, and I think it galvanized all the shareholders into thinking, do you know what, we came close to selling to people who um, we had no control of what they would do with the business. And as I said in the clip, actually, when we said, actually, we're pulling out of this, we don't want to go down this route. Some of them told us what they were actually going to do with the business, which they had kept <clears throat> totally um, uh, private to themselves. And it would have meant splitting up the business and doing all sorts of stuff. And we would have felt really guilty about it. So. We went back to Pep Franklin and said, can you talk us through the EO2 route and how would that work? And, you know, to the question that you asked earlier, how are you feeling about having gone down this route? I'm feeling pretty relaxed about it. You know, I, fe I feel, you know, literally as, as much about the business as I do really one of my children. It feels like that. I feel a sense of responsibility to it. I want to be involved, you know, whilst I'm still alive, I'm hoping it will go like John Lewis and carry on for the next 40 years or so. But I don't want to be pulling the levers. It would be wrong for the business and for me. I don't want to hand it on to our children. That would be wrong for everybody. Um, and so what is the most responsible thing to do? Whilst also thinking what's the best thing to do for the business? And I firmly believe that, you know, we have done a 20 year interview of the current management team uh, and they are bloody good. And they have gone through, as Beck says, an MBA and a half in the last couple of years. Um, and I'm a firm believer in, in empowering people who are properly motivated, uh, have the right intentions, and they will do much better than they think they can. And I think they think they'll do a good job. So it will, we've got the best chance of it going well. And I remember early days reading books by people like Sir John Herbert Jones, who ran ICI in the end, but he'd been a number two in a submarine in the, in the Second World War. And he said the best leader he's ever worked for was a 23 year old submarine commander who in peacetime would never have got the job till he was about 40. So actually, people don't necessarily need all the experience in the world. They just need to be given the gig, encouraged, nudged and supported. And the EOT structure allows us to stay around and be there for any questions we can answer and to encourage support and show an interest. Great. Thanks, Tris. Can I move on to another area of questioning, which is all about the impact on employees now? Um, and maybe, Nick, you can talk a little bit about this. Uh, there's a few questions about how you're structuring the employee council. Um, so how are you going about doing that? And do employees have a role on the trust board and may they have a role in the future on the main board? Can you maybe talk us about how you're going about it um, and what the ambition is for the future? Yes, of course. Uh, so we're we're right in the middle, actually, of running a uh, transparent, open voting process. Uh, so people put put uh, candidates forward for the employee council. Then there's an open vote that'll be held um, to to get twelve employee representatives onto an employee council this side of Christmas. So we're trying to move it forward quite quickly. 
Uh, we've, you can't be a member of the, the management team uh, on the employee council. It has to be uh, people uh, uh, not on the, the, the management team or directors. Uh, so hoping to get 12 in place this side of Christmas. Uh, we're also looking for a non-executive uh, with employee ownership experience to join us and join to help the employee representatives um, in, in their new role. We hope then to get two of the employee representatives onto the trustee board. Um, it may, we'll try before Christmas, but if not, it'll be early in the new year. So that we've got two trust, two um, employee representatives, trustee, trustee directors. We'll have Tris Bex and Will as former shareholders on, on the trustee board and a non-executive as well on the trustee board. So that's, that, that'll be the, trust, the, the structure of the trustee board and the employee council. Um, at the moment, um, I am on the trustee board, but I'll be stepping off uh, once we've got the employee representatives on so that we've got a clear division between management and directors and the trustees who we're going to uh, effectively, um, you know, be beholden to and report to and get challenge and support from. Great. And just and to be clear, none of, none of the shareholders will be on the management board. And in fact, whilst Nick's in charge to ensure that there is clarity that we are not sort of meddling from above, we have written in that we do not, we will not approve or get sight of, well, we will not have the power to approve the business plan whilst Nick's managing director. But should he change um, or retire, we will do so for the first three years of the incumbent as a CEO. There's, a, there's an interesting question here about the seasonality of some of your employees. So you talked about having a thousand people at its height in the summer, 400 sort of permanent people. So have you found that a challenge? How, do, how, how are you going to try and bring their voices to life? Or is that just not possible, do you think? Who do you want to Nick? answer? I'll ask yes. you, Nick, because you're left with Rick. <laughs> so, really, this is you um, putting it forward. Yeah, so that, that you know, they, they, they will be eligible to, to be part of the process to be voted onto the employee council uh, and indeed up, up, up onto the trustee board. So no, no one's ruled out. Um, you know, the only stipulation is that at least people have the intention of staying with us for uh, two years, because obviously we don't want a lot of change at the employee council um, board. So we're just asking people, if you're going to go for it, have the intention that you're going to be staying with us for at least two years. So, that, you know, we're hoping to, you know, so everyone will have the opportunity. Um, I think it's the challenge, as I said before, is make, making sure we get the message out there and um, make it very, very clear that people can, you know, if they're instructors, there might be um, seasonal, but they can still be part of the employee council. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back to um, Bex. There's a couple of questions here about legacy and um, protecting values and culture. And, and how how have you made sure, you know, Tris has just said he'd like to think Go Apes, like the John Lewis partnership, still around in 40 plus years. So, so can you just maybe tell us a little bit, or tell the audience a little bit about what you've put in place to secure that legacy and to protect the values and the culture? So we have written out um, the founder's wishes, and that is quite a four page or so document. Um, and I think as part of talking about the seasonality, this this kind of ties in with that, that when people join go they go through training, which includes online training. And as part of that, there will be uh, the, the ability to look at that. We will probably do a film to go with the founder's wishes so that people understand what the values are as they're coming into the business and the history, which I think is really important. Um, so ongoing, I think that that will work quite well. And I think the way that you build a culture that we have done is that the people who originally joined the business joined it for a reason. They joined it because they liked what they saw. They saw that there was real purpose and they then recruit people and uh, are brilliant about telling the story themselves. So I'm not worried about that suddenly disappearing. I think we're really good at, at keeping that at the heart of the business. Um, but, but you are right, you know, the founder's wishes, we don't want it to be sort of put in a cupboard in the bottom drawer. You know, it's got to be a live document that people engage with um, and that is used in, in every decision. We talk about the values and we've always looked at the values 
being at the core of our decision making. And so I would, uh, I, I know that that will carry on with Nick at the helm of the exec team and even in the trustee team and on the employee council, it will form the decision making ongoing for the business. Brilliant. I'm really sorry, but we've run out of time. Um, that went incredibly quickly. Um, so I'd like to thank the three of you for joining me live this morning. Thanks, Tris and Bex, for taking me up in the trees and giving me that adventure a couple of weeks ago and for doing our interview. Um, and maybe, you know, you may come back to us at some point, you know, maybe we can entice Nick back in a year's time to tell us all about how it's gone um, as you live life more adventurously. But um, for those of you who didn't get a chance to have your question, uh, don't forget this afternoon, 4.15, we've got our networking session. Now, um, Tris and Bex are busy, so they can't join us then. Uh, but Nick and one of his colleagues, Ben, will be joining um, so on the speaker's table. So please join us then. Um, don't forget to visit the exhibition don't forget to uh visit the the diary room and the the, the message wall um and we will see you back in the next session which starts at one o'clock um before we go uh, there will be a, a quick poll that pops up please do stay just tell us what you thought about the session um and i'd like to thank tris bex and nick again for joining us and hopefully i'll see you all again soon mm -hmm.